Jeremy, welcome, sí. <laughs> welcome to my show. So, would you like to start by a quick introduction, or just to tell us who you are and what's your sure. what's your background? So, I'm uh, I'm Jeremy Parsons. I call myself an ordained entrepreneur because I'm a Christian minister um, and an entrepreneur. So, uh, the balance between those two things has varied over time. But I guess we're talking about the entrepreneur side yes. today. Um, I've uh, I've been an entrepreneur some time, but I I think it took a long time to realise that's what I was. Okay. Um, and then I discovered that actually um, I'm really happy building businesses and helping other people build their businesses. So um, uh, that kind of is how we met, I guess. Yes, of course. Yes, yes. A long time ago, 10 years ago. Or so so can you give us a bit of a, a, a description of, about what are the businesses you're involved with at the moment? Sure. So, um, so at the moment, my, uh, my principal side hustle, if you don't mind me calling it that, is something called Magic Subscriptions, which is, um, which is a SaaS app to help people who want to run a subscription business to forget about everything apart from their side of it, which is curate um, products and offerings for their customers and get their customers um, in the door, at least to the one side of the funnel. And we make everything else happen by magic. Um, and that started life it spent quite a long time with something quite different called rumbly which was a very similar thing but very operating in a particular niche um, of the food space okay. uh, which was really fun um, but eventually we worked out it was always a little bit uphill and the smart things we were doing had huge benefits if other people um, applied them to their businesses so that's where magic subscriptions came from. great so that sounds like a pivot similar that's to pivot. <laughs> similar to what uh, i know instagram was first created to give people opportunity of apply beautiful filters on their pictures right and most people were using it to appreciate each other's pictures so that's yes, how they pivot. exactly yeah. so you discover the bit of what you do that actually creates value and then you say okay i'm going to forget all of the speculations I built around my idea, and I'm going to go with what people love. Which is the payment system. Basically. Which is the payment system and, and, and the magic um, organization of what customers get. Because a lot of subscription businesses, people are attracted to subscription businesses mm. because monthly recurring revenue yeah, is, a great, um, is a great thing to have versus always having to fight for the next little scrap of revenue. But actually sustaining that for a long period of time, so reducing churn, so making sure that your customers are excited by that experience, we handle that as well. So particularly, again, food would be a great example. Yeah. If you subscribe to food products, yes. we help to make sure that you mix it up in the right way so the customer doesn't constantly have to tweak um, what their order is from you. If they simply relax, mm. we learn their tastes, um, we give you a great experience. And indeed, we make sure that you occasionally get nice surprises that make you want to talk about the subscription service to your friends. Okay, so it sounds you're not simply providing a payment system, so you're helping hands-on hands, hands on the entrepreneurs to choose what they're doing. So, yes, so if the, if the entrepreneur is, is, um, is curating what goes into a, a, a typical yeah. bundle, if you like, then yeah. we're helping to manage that so they don't have to keep track of individual um, customers. We help to learn their preferences, we make sure that the orders are always um, a good experience, and we allow the entrepreneur to keep on focus on um, let's go and get, for example, if there's a, if there's a product in, um, uh, in the experience that actually customers are starting not to like, the, the entrepreneur can focus on go find something else. We get that information to them early because we build the feedback mechanisms and all of those other things. So yeah, there are plenty of, um, if you like, one act, uh, one trick pony subscription services out there, which are really built around the idea of you are okay, a software okay. entrepreneur, you want to manage subscription levels within your software, within your SaaS service, yes. those are great. We're doing something much more sophisticated, um, particularly around tangible products. So um, food products would be a great example, but food, a anything which is consumable, anything that you might want daily or weekly or monthly, yeah. and where the consumer wants to enjoy the experience without constantly having to tell you what to do. So if you're like Amazon is awesome. If you always, yeah. as a consumer, want to own every part of what am I going to receive, who's going to compete with Amazon? But if you're like me, there are some things where you think, actually, if it's coffee, I'd like someone else to give me nice surprises. And occasionally, you know, test me and stretch me. Um, and so Magic Subscription handles the magic. The entrepreneur handles, in that case, um, curating those coffees, making sure that there are the right offers and, um, uh, and if there are seasonal changes and so on, um, that's the place to be, which is, which is really good fun. We're just, we're just in customer development at the moment. So we are um, onboarding customers, but we're also investing quite a lot 
in helping those customers build great businesses um, because from our point of view we need to understand so much of the texture um, of an entrepreneurial subscription-based business so that we're delivering all the right value in the right places and then not treading on the toes of our own customers. Sounds fascinating. Really great. Okay, so can we... I, I'm curious to get into more about the product, maybe a bit later. I just wanted now, as we are still in introduction mode, I would like to go... You, you mentioned before you've been an entrepreneur for a long time. It took you a long time to discover. So how long have you been in the actual entrepreneur clothes, if you want? <laughs> so, um, so I think the time I started, when I definitely wouldn't have thought this is what I was doing, um, was I was a very typical geeky teenager. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I, wow. learned to, I learned to program. Um, uh, before I ever got to see a computer, yes, I am that old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then I acquired a computer and with some friends, um, we set up a little software business while we were still at school and, um, uh, and sold software by uh, hustling shows and, um, and hustling uh, magazines and trying to get coverage and trying to get people to buy okay. our software, which really was horrifically bad, just the kind of thing that some teenagers are going to produce. To At start. that time, <laughs> I guess the software was, well, the nature of computers was like this, so I guess. And it, and it was wild. So we really enjoyed writing, writing software. The fact that we had a completely random assortment of, uh, of things, a, a, a quotes word processor, um, some games, you know, it was just a random bundle. But we had a great time doing that. And actually, it was it was brilliant experience. Looking yeah. back, let's say from a personal point of view, that's when I should have spotted if I'd had any input yeah. around me. Entrepreneurs, I'm not sure were a thing, or at least not in, in my neck of the woods in those days. Definitely not. So I was thinking of life as what I loved to do was code. Yes. And the way of coding was get customers to pay me for it in, would in be, some way. Yeah. And actually, over time, I came to realize a long time later that although I was a perfectly adequate coder, I was a very good um, entrepreneur getting my foot in the door and, um, and opening yeah. opportunities and running at walls and occasionally managing to crack a hole in them. <laughs> very satisfying. Okay. So, but this is not eventually your, what the, the, the direction your career took because no, you, so, you do, you, I know you had some long-term employment. Yeah. So, so, so the first company I worked for was um, between school and university. Yeah. Um, a company called Control C Software, which um, which will mean something to anybody who's ever hit Control C on a keyboard. It was that moment of frustration when everything's gone wrong. Yes. What do you hit? Well, back in those days, it wasn't Control Out Dell. Um, it was uh, it was Control C. So the idea was, who do you call um, uh, Ghostbusters or Control C Software? So I was the first employee. Um, in the UK of, uh, of a startup that had been started by a Brit in America. Okay. He'd come back to the UK. Um, he'd, uh, he, he'd gone to my school, so he'd come back into my school and said, uh, you guys need to get into this whole computer thing. And by the way, is there someone who'd like to come work for me? Um, so uh, so, so I, you were still at school? At so I was still time. at school. College uh, kind of thing. Sixth form. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I was, and I've been helping with getting um, a new computer department set up and wow. building little networking structures because the school couldn't afford um, networking as well as computing. So, so yeah. I helped write the software that connected those computers without having to pay for the network. Wow. Um, and uh, Andy turned up and, uh, um, and that felt like uh, I hadn't given a moment's thought to what I was going to do. I was going to have about 10 months between finishing at school um, and, uh, and starting at university. I really hadn't given much thought to what I'd do. So I went off to Woking in Berkshire and, um, and became a, uh, a support programmer. So I got to write software. Yeah. I got to look after um, companies. And because I was the first employee in the door, I also did everything else. So I would package software, duplicate things, sure. um, write, uh, write stuff for, um, uh, for marketing material, everything, every job that needed to be done. Mm -hmm. Um, for, for a while, I was the only person who was permanently in the office. And there was a cast of characters who were actually juggling a day job <laughs> until they knew they'd get sacked in the end if they carried on doing that. Um, and gradually that, that built. Uh, can you explain to some people that might not know what uh, duplicating means? <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, back in the day, back in the day, um, our software went out on floppy disks and they were this size <laughs> eight, eight inch. inch floppy disks um, yeah. single sided or double sided um, I remember th these were very unfamiliar objects and uh, we were in these charming little um, uh, little offices in, in Wokingham and uh, at one time the, the postman 
folded over one of our master discs from America. We've mostly bought software from America um, with the distribution rights and uh, sold it sold it into, into the UK. Um, but uh, yeah, so this disc was folded over. It was going to probably take another three, four weeks um, to get another one. So we, we stuck it in every machine we had until eventually one of them made cluck, 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 cluck noises. Managed to collect. Managed to test our software. So, and so, so the process of, of duplicating software, I could say it's before the internet. I mean, the internet is very old, but it's before yeah. the time really that most people had um, uh, a connection, um, certainly before yeah. the time of the web. And servers. and Yeah, yeah. and so, yeah. so all of computing was, a, um, was about... There were computers over here, large and small, yeah. and managing to achieve something with those computers by loading them up with software, by making sure they didn't break, and by putting the right technical skills around them. That was that was the game. So, and, and we did consulting. So we we wrote software for money. Um, uh, we distributed um, software. Uh, so we, we took software um, from the original vendors yeah. and sold on to resellers. And we supported those resellers, and that that was itself was a fantastic education for me mm. because discovering how how very few, even back then when there were loads of computer resellers, um, how few of those resellers had any kind of technical computer <clears throat> insider experience. And at the time, I used to think, why are these people in that business? Um, but at looking back, actually, you realise quite early on, anybody can provide a technical business. Um, unless something's so brand new, there are no skills. Yeah. Um, uh, the skills are pretty generic, but it takes a certain kind of something to build an entrepreneurial business when no one else has seen one. So most of the the, uh, the customers we had were pe people who had that skill of, a, of making the sale. Yeah. Um, and they could have been selling anything and they happened to be selling computer systems. So as a, as a support engineer and also as a, um, as a consultant, um, helping them because every bit of help that we gave them meant that they would then sell in bits of software that we were selling them. That's that's how the game worked. <laughs> wow, that's a blast from the past for me. <laughs> Very interesting. My my first piece of um, of like commercial software was writing a commercial duplicator um, to speed up that process of manufacturing because we said, spent so much time manufacturing software because although we just talked about those great big discs, the other detail was nothing was compatible with anything else. No. Yeah, yeah, so you had oriented. to have um, all sorts of complicated ways to manufacture that software. So yeah. it was so burdensome. And so I wrote a really bad um, program that was so much better than, than we'd done before. And then about a year later, um, I came back and I, I used to work on vacations and so on. Then I wrote it well because I knew how to write great software. Um, and in fact, I wrote it against the express instructions of my boss. My boss said, it works, Leave don't mess it. with it. So I just did it as a Moonlight project. Um, demonstrated uh, it worked. That, that, that it worked. Um, it worked much faster and much more reliably than you were. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Job done. But yeah. I started to shift into um, sales and marketing and, and um, uh, the more I did my consulting um, side, <coughs> the more you naturally get into um, sales and marketing. So so I went off on courses, learned to sell, learned, to, um, learned some, uh, some, some of the basics of marketing and then discovered that I was great at pictures. Um, and the moment at which I kind of realized that, uh, that the place to be um, was if you like the other side of the fence um, was when I helped rescue a project that had gone so badly wrong. Mm. And it was my technical skill that helped me work out what the rescue was gonna look like. Yeah. But it was all about the pitch, yeah. getting customers to stop quite literally suing the business wow. and instead paying extra to get the software completed. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So that obviously had a natural progression until when was your last kind so, of employment job? <laughs> oh, right. So, so um, I'll, 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 I'll spare you a few details, but the, 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 no. after that time, the, the, the most significant individual period of, of employment, yeah. and this really marked the beginning of the end of me deciding it was great to be paid by someone else to, um, to work for them. Yeah. Um, I spent about 10 years working for a company called Cable Wireless, yes. um, which had a UK brand called Mercury. So back in the day, there were two options for your telephone service. You could have BT, you could have Mercury. And, and Mercury, Mercury was the low cost. When I arrived in the UK, low, there was exactly. you, you had the, the Mercury the blue button. button. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and I had a specialization in pricing. Mm. Um, and uh, 
price is really important in telecoms because yeah. really nobody cares about anything apart from the phone. The cost. So, well, the phone needs to work, and then it's all about the price plans. Um, and funnily enough, because Mercury had largely recruited out of UK monopolist BT yeah. and Irish monopolist Telecom Aeron, um, there weren't really those kind of skills in the business. So, so I got involved across the business, even though I sat in the enterprise division. Mm. Nevertheless, there were so few people doing, um, doing, uh, doing the work that I did that I worked with consumer and small business and everything else. And because I was technical, um, I could also work very closely with, with the billing um, people. So billing was, I was based in London, the billing people were in uh, near Milton Keynes, um, and I would quite often just double up. So I would go really, really early well, so, and go yeah. spend time with billing people, because that then meant that they knew how to, um, how to support the price plans that I was going to need, and they had no nasty surprises. And that cut across the strategic... Um, IT development. So the strategic IT development was we're going to turn off all of this stuff at some point yeah. in the future, um, and uh, and that was ignoring um, the commercial reality. So I was a kind of a little, I had a, like, like a little skunk work with um, with the very smart IT people in the in the division that was meant to terminate, if you like, um, and we kept uh, kept Mercury far ahead of um, of, of its competition as the, the market opened up. And then I went, uh, I went from poacher to gamekeeper. So I went to work some cable and wireless in its monopoly markets um, in, the, in the Americas. So that was kind of fun. I had lots and lots of experience with mergers and acquisitions. That was one of the things I really, really wanted to have experience of. Um, and that was brilliant. I, I got to, to work with uh, all over the world with, um, uh, with big and smallish, small by enterprise standards, but, but um, still kind of medium and upward sized businesses. Mm. And... Um, uh, and yeah, so that was 10, 10 kind of great years. The job that I took after that um, was, you might call it a tactical job. So I, so I knew that I needed to, to, to bridge to something. I mm. knew I needed to have a bit of credentials outside my current company. So, um, so I went and worked in, um, in the Northwest for a while, um, helping a, an alternative internet access technology. Um, I thought I was being hired to uh, to bring it to market, and it turned out I was being hired to shut it down quietly because <laughs> partners had fallen out. Okay. Uh, and then um, I suddenly discovered that along the way, the bit yeah. I missed is all of this time, mm. really from university um, uh, onwards, I was always helping pe people get their business started. Yeah. Because it just, I just had these skills. I'd had some training. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed it. So why sure. wouldn't you? I used to go at barbecue consultancy. So, so the number of businesses I've, I've worked with. So when I was at the point where I really wanted to go and do something else, um, it was really easy because lots of people were saying, oh, uh, if you're thinking about a change, can you come help us? So for a time, I was just going to the people who'd said, can you come help us? And helping, I helped a business uh, maximize their, um, their sale value as they were, they were yeah. going to exit their business. Um, I, I helped lots of businesses to start. And I acquired a whole lot of skills um, in, you might say, bridging the world of, business theory mm. to the practicalities of how people are because actually there really aren't very many magic secrets in business yeah. but quite a lot of people ignore or overlook the completely obvious and it's because it's not put to them in good ways or it's because people that you trust um, give you terrible advice you know. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yes yes and so um my i, I would say my first uh, full on entrepreneurial startup was a financial management outsourcing business. That might sound like a jump, but as as I already said, one thing I'd learned quite early on was um, if you have enough knowledge, um, then uh, then the the front end skill of that is all about relationships and, mm. um, and selling processes. Um, so there's a guy who was really the founder of this business, and um, a bit of barbecue consultancy. He had a terrible idea, and I knew it was a terrible idea. Um, but I could see that over time, if he stuck with it, it could become a better idea. So okay. we kept in touch for a long time. Um, and, uh, and each time he'd done something that I suggested that he did, it worked. And so he said, actually, Joy, you can just do this. So we re-engineered his idea right. into something that would scale, yeah. that would work really well. Um, and, uh, and so I helped take it from nothing to a run rate of a million um, annualised. Uh, in, in about 15 months, um, uh, which is cool. And really, that, 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 that was a, a great experience. Um, and, 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 you know, just 
awesome but very very tiring as well so i think that was yeah. that was i've been in startups before but probably not with that level of pressure mm. um, so this was the first time so were you were you involved in the business you had a, yeah. a stake in the business so they gave he, this yeah. guy gave you a so chunk of the business yeah, so, so you became an yeah, entrepreneur in all yes, so that was your that first was, very first experience my first, my how, first how long ago was that Oh my goodness, well, before you and I met each other. So, so more than 10 years ago. More than 10 years ago. Okay. Um, and it was a kind of crazy time. It was a great, great learning experience. Um, really satisfying from my point of view that, that, that we actually smashed the business plan objective. Yeah. Um, also, I think it, it also taught me, so that I really enjoyed that, 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 yeah. that building the business. Um, uh, and it, it left me with a lot of insight into the financial management of the businesses, which mm. is, is kind of cool. Um, but it also left me feeling yeah, this is a little bit away from my home because my home really is tech. <laughs> and so, right. so when I when I came to Cambridge, yeah. um, uh, uh, Cambridge is is a great hub of, um, of, of tech course. business of mm. all sorts. Um, and uh, so yeah, a, a bigger playground and a great opportunity to to do all kinds of things with all kinds of cool people. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Excellent. Well, this is uh, going. Amazing, you know, for me is always amazing here. These old stories about how people change it. So, in terms of like going from your last employment job into this first entrepreneurial experience, um, yeah, and adventure, let's call it. Was it something that you were already out of of work and you were looking for something interesting to do, or was it more like uh, you saw the opportunity, you dump? Your it's, old job. So, so again, something I just hadn't realised yeah. wasn't common um, uh, means that the answer to that is a really fuzzy answer. Mm. It never occurred to me when I when I took sales training and marketing training, I was working for a small company. Yeah. So it never occurred to me that it would be normal just to focus narrowly on um, developing your sales and marketing skills within the confines of that company. It was really obvious when you go and do um, sales and marketing training. Yeah. You need breadth, you need depth, you need, you need experience. And so, sure. uh, so I had always, without ever thinking it was strange, yes. just spent time with other people on their projects. So, so actually the network I had yeah. um, and the network that grew as people kind of came to me because it turned out I was the kind of person that if we were at a barbecue and you said, actually, can you come have a little look at my business idea and what am I doing? Um, even though so often I was essentially telling people to do the same thing, which right. was that plan you've got, way too fast, way too risky. <laughs> let's do less, <laughs> let's risk less, and let's push harder. Yeah. So actually I'd done, I'd been involved in other people's businesses um, and I never really thought of that as, as unusual. So mm. by the time, say I, I was kind of drawn into that world, um, just naturally anyway. There were plenty of people that I'd worked in the businesses. In fact, um, uh, there was even a business in, in Cambridge who was, a, who was a supplier to Cable and Wireless. And the thing that used to frustrate me about them was they were brilliant at doing their job technically. Mm. They were very poor at the relational aspect of that. Mm. And so I could never give them as much of the work um, as some of the businesses who were much better at that. Yeah. Um, uh, so so I'd, I'd even done a little bit of help in saying, look, let's keep this quiet, but can I help you to work out how to sell better <laughs> into my organization? Because then you'll get more work and we'll, 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 we'll both do well. <laughs> so you're helping your customers, help, your help suppliers supplier, to sell you to sell. better. Okay. Yeah, because then I could give them more of the work. So I, yeah. I won't name the particular company. No, no, the competitor no. was McKinsey. I always loved McKinsey. Um, but McKinsey's, uh, right, you know, McKinsey famously is going to charge three, four, five times as much as McKinsey and Pan, the, the consultancy firm you're talking right. about. Right. So, so I was always happy. I was always happy to work with McKinsey's, but I always knew that if I could hire somebody else, I'd get more work, work done with the same budget. Um, so, uh, yeah. so, so actually uh, taking those sort of insights, um, and, and other, I mean, any large company tends to have a, a, a lot of strategic suppliers. Yeah. Um, but helping a, a company that was niche, it fitted us exactly. And it did the technical work really, really well and pride itself on it, but it just didn't know how to manage an enterprise sale. And anybody who's a middle manager in, in a large company, um, you know at the end of the day, your boss has to be happy with what decision yeah. you're making. So, so you, you know, it's not good enough to simply say, these guys can do a better job. Because if they know, <laughs> because um, another company is managing that, that process better, that, that if you like, the, not so much the delivery of the immediate service, but think about that whole experience. 
clients. Yeah. What is it like to be a regular client of this kind of service? What does it feel like? What does it? Um, uh, what are the things people say afterwards? When you've got a company that just focuses on its narrow little niche, no, those course. stories don't come out, and therefore, well, they don't feel like the, the, the kind of strategic supplier that you might be wanting. So, so again, that was a great insight, and it, but it still took me a long while. I, I, I must be a very slow learner. It took me a long while to realise that everything I was doing um, was kind of entrepreneurial. And I wasn't yeah. particularly looking for gaps to jump into. Um, I was looking, and still am to, to, to a remarkable extent actually, looking for things that will interest me. Yes. And my first boss, Andy, I mentioned, who, was, uh, who went to my school, um, and turned up, he, uh, he once asked me, um, what are you looking for in a job? And I gave some kind of answer that must have sounded clever to me. That must be the sort of thing I'd read in a business book. Yeah. And he said, oh, that's really interesting. He let me talk and talk and talk. And he said, that's really interesting. It's really simple for me. <coughs> fun and profit. <laughs> he said, if there's no fun, I'm not interested. If there's no profit, it, it, it leads nowhere. So I'll take those two. <laughs> and I'm not saying though that's, fun that's my formula, but my goodness, it's not a bad I think <laughs> it's answer. it's a very simple... At least there's a very simple rule, you know, you can, you can add that. Is there one? Is yeah. there? If yeah. not, yeah. So, but it must be both fun and, it can't sure. be fun or. Well, yes. And, <clears throat> and I think a lot of people make a mistake of they find the place where they have the most fun and then they ignore the fact it's really hard to make a profit yeah. in that, at that area. So I would, I, again, I would advocate to people, actually, if you find that the place you have most fun doesn't produce the profit, then fine, do that. Just don't pretend it's your business opportunity. No. Just arrange your life so that you can have the fun um, uh, and find some other part in which perhaps you have a little bit less fun, um, but it funds what you want to achieve. Fantastic. So now the first question, the next question comes like, when you decided to move into your first full-on entrepreneurial experience, was anything holding you back? Yeah, yeah. So the stories that I used to tell myself um, there were a lot of stories that I had that, looking back, were all about how large companies manage their employees. Mm -hmm. Because large companies, back in the day, and still lots of large hierarchical companies, the trick is to persuade everybody in the organisation that their best interests are served by moving a step up, a step up, a step up, a step across, yeah. a step up, you know, and so on. And so, for instance, I was utterly convinced that... I was a happy number two and shouldn't ever be the leader. Okay. In spite of the fact that actually, if you look at the evidence, all of my career really is I'm the person who drives towards, no, no, let's do this. This is the opportunity. Yeah. Um, and actually I've managed, uh, managed large teams and small and I can bring people together. But I had this running narrative that no, no my job is always to find the person I can be number two to. Right. Funnily enough, a boss, one of my most memorable and best ever bosses, someone that would be really great if you could talk to sometimes, <laughs> boss of the details, was someone who actually is in that mold. So someone who um, who discovered for themselves that actually being the boss, the, 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 the final door and so on, isn't something that likes their capital particularly. Mm. Um, uh, that's absolutely right for, for them. But it's, it's what <coughs> enterprises that employ um, you as a yeah. manager uh, want to persuade you of. So that was something. I also had this idea that um, progression needed to look like, um, I think you need to be able to chart it out on a map. You need to have objectives and goals. Mm. And, um, and I'm very thankful to somebody. So there was, uh, Cable Wireless was one of those companies that was always reorganizing. Okay. And um, so I, I got to know someone in their HR function. So I worked on the international side, so you work quite a lot with HR um, as you're planning moves and so on. Um, uh, so someone who was, who had taken the opportunity to take voluntary redundancy okay. um, because she could see that the opportunity to go, go solo was really good. And so what, what happened was we were working together in, in her regular HR business partner um, uh, fashion for me. Um, and then on the side, I was helping her prepare <laughs> to get her business up and running. And mm. she was giving me good advice mm. um, that, if you like, was good advice full stop as opposed to good advice within the world of Kevin right. Wilds. And so I, I kind of learnt how to rephrase my own ambitions in ways that were less kind of within the corporate mould. And, and probably the, the final point of that, you could say, so, so I, 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 um, I turned up in Cambridge um, in a slightly strange way. And mm. um, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, that um, I'm, uh, I'm an ordained Christian minister of the Church of England. Yeah. Cambridge, in a way, was my last attempt to not 
um, get ordained, but also it was a place that I wanted to study if I did. So I came to Cambridge. Mm. I wasn't trying to um, construct some new entrepreneurial thing, but I did need to make body and soul. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I needed to keep food on the table and so on. Yes. And, and so, uh, so when I arrived, arrived in Cambridge, um, before I was here, I had a number of phone numbers, a number of business cards, and a number of identities to try <laughs> and see what happened, see what Cambridge did when I came here. Um, and um, so this is, I didn't call it split testing, but it's what it was. So I would go to different events. I would give out different business cards, same name, but different phone number and <laughs> different, different yeah. and see what worked. And eventually I, I found what worked. And having done that, I, I pressed into, if you like, the entrepreneurial community in Cambridge. Yes. But by that stage, knowing that at some point I was going to be, um, uh, I was going to be disappearing into, um, into full-time training for a period, um, and then re-emerging, who knows what. So that said, I didn't know if the other side of that training, I would then be called, you're a vicar now, you don't deal with any of those th th these things. But in fact, when I started doing vicar, yeah. I was also digging deeper into an entrepreneurial community and therefore did what I'd done for years and years, yeah. help other people yeah. get their ventures up and running, work better, um, uh, deal with little issues like uh, the funding's gone wrong and all random experience that I built um, it came to just a great place to, to apply that experience because to be honest if you go um, 50 yards from where we are right now yeah. and you whisper has anybody got a startup <laughs> people are going to go oh yeah yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and so there's, there's opportunities to, um, to do that so w when I carried on doing that after training yeah. um, it's just a fantastic experience but also it means that I've, I've ended up in this slightly curious place that the balance between my own entrepreneurial projects and my work helping other people has ended up in, in probably a different place than I'd ever have expected. Yeah. But really fun. So I feel like I have one principal personal project and then I have several um, other projects where I'm helping other people. Um, and I juggle my time around that and I get lots of fun out of that. Always fascinating to hear your story. <laughs> <laughs> so do you remember... Um, the biggest challenge you faced into your transition to entrepreneurship? Um, so, so I suppose when you're in a situation, so, 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 so the first business I mentioned where I'd say I was definitely an entrepreneur, even though I didn't use that language and didn't yeah. think of myself in that way. Um, as soon as you realize hmm. that I had lots and lots of corporate background, working on projects, yeah. looking at profiling things, uh, recognizing not everything works, it's so different when your one project is the thing you're sitting in. And when burn rates at the cliff you're heading for, <laughs> that's a real event um, out into the future. Mm -hmm. And I think the, um, uh, the, 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 the how you have to be able to function in a circumstance, for instance, in an early stage in a lot of businesses, it's the case that every time you turn up and you have a potential sales or partnership um, uh, results, you may be on the cusp, um, a point between success and failure, yeah. right on there. But you've got to have that relaxation. You've got to be able to walk away, not take bad business just out of desperation. And I hadn't, in truth, my corporate background, I'm not sure, sure I've ever been kind of feather bended in that respect, but you do come to expect certain things that you don't notice. So, for example, if you're a large company, if you have a profitable piece of that company mm -hmm. that consumes lots of cash, you, that's fine you don't have to worry about that because there's a place to go and get the cash mm. you can make the profit you can make the cash yeah. out in the wide world lots of profitable businesses go bust yeah. and that's because they need cash and there is no source of that cash so actually learning that I mean it's great within a financial management business of course happily we had lots of people who could do those, those subs yes. but it also meant keeping people's morale up Part of my job was training accountants to sell. A lot of accountants really don't want to think of themselves as salespeople. No. But they would also know the situation we're in and, um, uh, and the dance that you're doing. Um, I love, I'm a bit of a fan of Seth Godin. He talks about um, the, the, the fact that as humans, we flourish when we dance on the edge of failure. So that 18 month period, the first 12 months was definitely dancing on the edge of failure all the time. And then you get into a routine. Yeah. So then we're at the stage where we had a sales process that was yeah. working well, um, our relationships worked well, and therefore we were getting referrals in, um, uh, and, and so on. So things were kind of lined up. But, um, but in the period up to that, of course, every day, everyone who's at the centre, there are four of us who were, um, uh, who were equity um, holders there, every one of you knows, you could get a phone call today 
and it could be the making of you or it could be yeah. the beginning of the end and occasionally you have to make these huge um, huge kind of pivots and because I had a certain amount of experience in disaster management it also <laughs> meant that when our financial directors which we employed many um, when occasionally they mess something up yeah the default person to go and feel was me. Yeah, was so all there. of a sudden I had to become an expert in cycle parts distribution or whatever it might be yeah. because um, I would have to make sure that whatever mess had been created, yeah. the promise had been rashly made, yeah. and um, uh, somehow we would, we would work our way out of that. So I drove an awful lot of miles. Um, I, had to I had to pretend to be everywhere in the, in the country um, because our, yeah. um, our customers were all over the place. And that was great, uh, but it also taught me. Okay, if I'm going to work this hard, um, I think I probably want a bigger stake. So I had, so I was the smallest of the four um, uh, equity holders. And, so you got and the least interest. In, in truth, it was it was a great ride. I really enjoyed it, but it it never felt like there was never a day when I thought this is what I'm going to do for for, for for the next ten years. It was always I want to get this to a million annualized run rate um, because that would be the point where I could go job done and actually you don't need me anymore Fantastic. the other thing i learned really early on everybody tells you make yourself indispensable um i've always applied exactly the opposite, the opposite. if you constantly make yourself useful and available yeah and work to make sure that you can disappear at a moment's notice yeah the opportunities multiply and people don't worry about yeah but something's gonna break i don't know nothing's gonna break it's gonna get better the day i walk away it'll get better because um actually if you get things running well there comes a point when you if, if, if you're like me and a bit of a butterfly brain you're at risk of interfering with things that are working just yeah. fine um so if you if you get things running smoothly and, and it works then um then step away just leave it <laughs> yeah 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 absolutely great is there one particular person who had most influence in your entrepreneurial life? So I mentioned Andy a couple of times. Andy Johnson Laird, who um, uh, I, the, the, the thing when I first met him that, yeah. uh, that made him feel most awesome was that um, uh, that you could buy um, you know these these, uh, these kind of novelty toilet papers that you get with wise sayings. <laughs> so Johnson Laird's law turns up on some. Um, uh, toilet paper wise sayings okay. which is toothache tends to start um, on Friday night <laughs> the moment when you think that you can relax and have fun that's when the, 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 the rot sets in and he taught me a lot um, he taught me a lot about uh, because I was his first employee in the UK yeah. and uh, in a way I had is he American bosses. guy? He's British, but okay. he lives in America now. He lived in America for okay. 20 or 30 years by the okay. time I met him. Oh, wow. um, so culturally really quite American. Very entrepreneurial, very ambitious, very frustrated mm. by the UK at that time. Yeah. Um, uh, but he, would, he, he learned that he could trust me. He could, he could talk to me in a way that you know, I wouldn't um, betray those sort of confidences. So I learned a lot from his, um, from his successes and from his mistakes. Mm. I learned an awful lot about... Um, how to fund um, a startup, those challenges around growth, yeah. um, uh, how to work your way into impossible opportunities, the number of places that Andy managed to position, um, Control C Software and Johnson Lane Incorporated, the US um, counterpart, where, where we really shouldn't have had any business being there. Wow. And Andy was going to work us in. And, and I, got to, uh, uh, I got to know people, I got to know situations and so on by that proximity. In some ways, it, probably the things for a few years afterwards, um, I, I probably didn't think very well of him uh, because he made a couple of bad mistakes mm. that were very painful, uh, not for me, but for other people in the, in the organisation. So I'd go, oh, he made mistakes. And then a few years on, he realised, no, my goodness, he made opportunities. He made businesses. Yeah. He made things happen where there was nothing happening. Yeah. Um, his particular skill was spotting neglected corners of IT hmm. where everybody else was running away. Yeah. And he would say, no, no, okay, we can that's something. where we're going to go. If we go there, I know there's going to be something there. And he could work his way into creating a proposition, creating lucrative lines of business. So at the end of the company, if any day of the week somebody said, what's your business? You knew it might be completely different in six months' time. So it was a great experience for me, yeah. quite unsettling for people who thought of their careers in a different way. Yeah. But, uh, but no, he was, he, was, uh, he was a great guy. I learned so much from him. I'm still learning from him as I remember things that I did with Andy that at the time I was too young and green to understand. Go, oh, no, that's why he did that. <laughs> Fascinating. 
Um, great. Uh, <laughs> really amazing. All this stuff. Um, do you remember one mistake in your entrepreneurial career more painful than others? So there's one particular yes. real blunder <laughs> which, which happened um, 300 yards in that direction. Okay. So I only really in Cambridge was I really understanding that I'm a pitch guy. And that might sound bizarre, but because so many people were pitching their stuff in Cambridge, mm -hmm. suddenly you're like, actually, I'm quite good at this. And um, so the <coughs> precursor business of, um, uh, of magic subscriptions was something called Rumbly. Yeah. Rumbly was something I really pulled out of my back pocket when I needed to magic up yeah. a business that we could put a team together. Because I had yeah. a team, we had a business. And um, so I wanted to pitch. Yeah. I had an investor, I won't, won't, uh, won't name him, but uh, someone no. that you will know. Um, uh, and I had two things. Um, there was a project that I thought had massive, massive potential yeah. um, that was in uh, in <coughs> smart power management. Oh yeah. And then there was Rumbly, which was uh, which was exciting, but it was a student project. Um, so I pitched this inve in investor um, uh, on the expensive project that was well out of his kind of knowledge. And really, I wanted the feedback from it. Said, yeah. Yeah, really not for me. Um, so I'm a pitch guy. <laughs> so I said, oh, but you might be interested in it. pitch the money. Um, he said, yeah, I'll invest and and um, uh, and agreed to to write a check. Um, but the problem was I, I wasn't really prepared for this particular pitch. So I'd invented a figure. <laughs> said, give me this this amount of money for that amount of equity, mm. which was a no regrets deal. I, it, the numbers that I picked were clearly, if if he'd been willing to do that deal, um, everyone in the team would have been happy. Um, but he said, no, I'll give you. This smaller amount for a proportionately small amount of equity. So it was, a, it was I think it was something like 25,000. Um, so the equity percent. in proportion was the same. Yeah. So let's say I'd asked for 250,000 for um, uh, for 10%. Yes. Um, and, and it became 25,000 for one for them, or whatever it was. Yeah. That sort of thing. Um, and so we sort of agreed. <laughs> but I didn't know what to do next because. Oops. Um, so in that, in that situation, I just let that, 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 that sort of run along. Um, and I'm quite embarrassed. I'm not even sure I told um, anybody in the team at that stage because I didn't really know what to do next. Oops. Because I wasn't really in a fundraising mode. I hadn't been thinking about that project. <laughs> and so in the end, I've stayed friendly with, um, uh, it, well, at least we, we're, we're in touch from time to time um, uh, with, the, uh, with the investor. But it was always slightly embarrassing that I'd never come back and asked him for his money. <laughs> By the time I thought, oh, this is what I'd spend it on. We've kind of left it a bit too late. And all this time I've been helping other people right. um, get their initial investments, either through individual investors or through accelerators, yeah. um, things associated with the University of Cambridge, um, things associated with Cambridge Angels and so on. Yeah. Um, but this particular personal thing, somehow I just managed to deprioritize it. It was almost like that moment at which I just automatically, yeah. pitch. I, just, I just didn't know what to do next. That was such a mistake. So stupid. <laughs> well, we learn from our mistakes, don't we? Um, within your entrepreneurial past, would you change anything in it? So, uh, for sure, of course. I mean, oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> the, the, but the, I, I guess the things I've already alluded to, there were certain things that I thought were true. Um, yeah. What I haven't said was growing up in the part, of, I, I grew up not so far away from here in Suffolk. Mm. And Suffolk uh, today, we yeah. have real problems with aspirations as a county. Mm. Um, so our school system tends to have relatively low aspirations. Kind of, there, are, there are high spots, of course. Um, but somehow there's this almost like kind of cultural malaise. So it never occurred to me that somebody like me, coming from somewhere like that, yeah. could ever be any of those things. So if you like, there's a whole category of stuff where I just never noticed. And for goodness sake, for years I was so embarrassed that that little software startup that I'd started in the sixth form with, uh, with, with, um, uh, with a couple of other friends, uh, and it never occurred to me. It was a, it was a really good tech. We didn't make tons of money. No. My goodness, we snuck into shows. We sold stuff. <laughs> we, you know, we, we didn't get, um, uh, you know, we, we didn't break anything. Yeah. The customers we sold software to kept the software, didn't ask for their money back. Fantastic. Um, and it was kind of cool. But but somehow it it never occurred to me that that was there. So there a bunch of things that I just thought like that thing about, um, uh, yeah, my job is to find the the lead guy so I can be a great number two to there's a whole bunch of things where I'm pretty sure if I thought about my own if I'd even been analytical if I'd done with myself what I've done with some, some of the other people which is say let's find what you're really good at 
<laughs> and work out not how to make that the whole of your life, but yeah. work out how to match that up with other people so you can kind of develop teams. Then I'm sure they'll learn that quicker. But then again, I really like being around at the moment. So perhaps I wouldn't change a thing. Perhaps you would. <laughs> it's funny how you start. Of course there are. And now at the end of it, no. Well, it's, um, I think it's a part of your, of your experience. And, and I'm using it for good, if you like. So I'm, I'm back in, living in Suffolk now. Yeah. And, um, and with some of the other like-minded people, we've set up something called Innovate Suffolk. Yes. Where we're going to run events um, that are entrepreneurial, pull people together for yeah. 48 intense hours, suspending this belief yes. on, can we get a project um, out of this and get up and running? So I'm very determined to help people in Suffolk realise mm. that Suffolk isn't too close to Cambridge or too far from it, too close to London or too far from it. We've yeah. got so many brilliant facilities yes. and quality of life second to none and nurturing entrepreneurial talent is just something I love to do. Suffolk. <laughs> Don't say it like that. Suffolk, yeah, it sounds like... <laughs> it's, uh, it's not famous for next... things, but my goodness, no, of course. it's the home of BT Innovation. And although yeah. BT's innovation on the world stage perhaps is it's a little bit less famous than it was um, 10, 20 years ago, nevertheless awesome people amazing things going on yeah um, uh, in that whole area but again Suffolk has what I used to have which is that thought that yeah but nothing's ever quite going to happen and then when you change the game and you say yeah but okay let's we're going to make let's it accept, happen let's just accept nothing's ever going to happen but what could we do yes. let's do something we can do yes and then yes, of yes, course yes. over time you start to, start to think oh we started doing some of those things we said could never happen and I'm perfectly happy I will agree with people till the cows come home, um, that you can't ever achieve this thing you set out to achieve. But I'll also say, what can we do today? I, and I have, uh, again, useful terminology I picked up, bias to action. I do have a bias to action. And that means I'd far rather um, start trying something out than spend another week or month thinking about what we might do. So it's not, I'm not saying jump before you think, but quite often the problem people have is that they never take their idea into the world. They want to polish it a bit, polish it a bit, yeah. polish it a bit. Yeah, it's never good enough, and therefore they don't do it. Well, yeah. I, I noticed myself uh, how uh, more recently, a lot of people that eventually succeed in something is because they try lots of things, and yeah. they, they accept failure, and they just move on. They look don't look for failure as such, but if you accept failure, you're happy to move on fast. Otherwise, yeah. you, you're always hoping that... Uh, this is going to be the perfect thing. Yes. Like, and, and the worst of all, you occasionally meet people who are, are doing exactly the same thing they've been doing forever, which is inching forward on an idea that's yeah. growing bigger and bigger and more and more beautiful, but it's also more and more impossible to move yeah, forward yeah, yeah. because every time you, you engage with the world, something will change. Yeah, the, 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 absolutely. The great story that gets told, a great example is, you know, if you want to get on a flight to New York, yeah. um, within moments of takeoff, the flight is way off course, but you don't go and land again and try again and set the best. No, no. Once you're in the air moving, you can adjust your course. You can get to Of it. course. Of course. Do you remember your proudest moment as an entrepreneur? <laughs> oh, golly. Um, uh, well, probably the vainglorious proudest moment was um, uh, to, to, I once with a, um, with a, with a team of, uh, um, of like-minded people we managed to raise um, 750 million pounds. Um, for on the back of nothing more than a PowerPoint deck. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was quite something. I will say that was quite something. <laughs> 750 million. Yep. That sounds like a... Three times 250. So three, three 250 investors, private equity, commercial bank, and investment bank. And wow. the experience of doing that was, was, was astonishing. It also happened to be, it was just before the great telecoms crash. <laughs> so, so you got it just in time. So the rest of the rest of my uh, the, the team I was on, I think then um, spent a little bit of while either running away from um, that industry or gently shutting down and selling off the bits that had, uh, had been built. But that was kind of cool. Great. Now you mentioned uh, obviously the Suffolk entrepreneurship, uh, yeah. but this is more of a mentorship activity you do. So. So we're running events. Yes. Um, so if, if people have come across things like um, Techstars, Startup Weekends, yes. like that. So, so that, that, that kind of events, but working closely um, with, in partnership with, wherever we can, mm. anyone running incubators, accelerators, and indeed the individuals yeah. who either currently are entrepreneurs or have those aspirations. So we're, we're, we're using the events as a way of bringing people together. Yeah. Because a problem in Suffolk, and a problem in lots of places, 
is there are lots of people doing cool things, but they don't know each other. Yeah. There aren't places where they can work intensely. Yeah. And of course, if you're on your own project, you don't want to be distracted into something else yeah. um, and drawn into making lots of promises to, uh, I think this is a mistake made quite often, is that yeah. you have people at quite early stage and they're suddenly put on, on a big stage because someone wants to celebrate the success yeah. of their venture, but suddenly they're spending so much time being a role model, they're not progressing their business. So we're creating much more intense experiences where people come together, learn from each other, yeah. um, and then go back and, and hopefully do cool things. What is this initiative called? So this is Innovate Suffolk. So InnovateSuffolk.com um, gets you to, to, to the website. First event um, from, from where we are today. Yeah. It's about a month in the future, um, uh, May 2019. And we're expecting to run a couple of those events a year where we yeah. crush people in, choose a theme, and try and create businesses on the back of it. Yeah. Um, and over time, uh, we're also building mentor networks, uh, advisory board, and so on, so mm. that we, we can begin with a particular emphasis on tech. So Suffolk yeah. does have some tech, um, has lots of tech potential. Yeah. Not famous for building tech businesses, but I've met lots of people doing really cool things. Yeah. Also, not everybody can become Facebook, Google, or Amazon. Well, you know, there are great potential to make a million pounds business. Yes, exactly. Tens of million pound business, great lifestyle businesses that can employ maybe hundreds of people. So. Not everything has to become no. and, and, <laughs> Google. And if you'd like, you know, if you'd like the, the famous um, uh, ten minute commute, <laughs> yeah. then, then happily we're in the days of uh, of fiber broadband pretty much everywhere. And yeah. So, um, so you can choose to have a high quality of lifestyle. Yeah. Um, and fortunately, we have great transport links. So yes. Uh, so being able to stay connected with your particular community, whether something's a great place to start businesses, some of those businesses naturally will gravitate to other places. But at the moment, my focus is let's help people get things started well. Yeah. Let's, people, let's help people who are starting already to work out how to accelerate well. Yeah. And those are two completely different challenges. Startup well is often about choose somewhere where the wind is at your back. The number of people I meet where the thing they're trying to do is boil the ocean. <laughs> or at the very least, they've got a great idea, but they've chosen to do it the way everyone else is doing. And the yeah. way everyone else is doing things often feels like you've got to risk a lot of money and yeah. and, 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 well, why don't you just initially pick something where the cash flow is in your favor, the yeah. opportunity is in your favor, the access to, to potential customers in your favor. And sure, that'll only take you so far, but you might as well start in an easier place, yeah. um, solve difficult problems in an easier mar market space, yeah. and you can grow out from there. And of course, the other the other problem, I suppose, if you're in such a beautiful part of the world, is people people just do enough. So they'll, they'll create a nice business, a nice little niche, and they're perfectly happy in that in yeah, this environment. Yeah, so yeah. those people either I've got to leave them alone, or I've got to challenge them and say, "Look what you've done, and now you've taken your foot off the pedal. So why don't you either walk away from that, hand it over to the team that you've got that are running it perfectly well, and come and yeah. do something else? Because if you could do that again, yeah. you can manage, you can multiply businesses, or maybe there's something that you're doing." that you know we could take just to another level. And let's go do that. Great. Absolutely great. Do you think more people should become entrepreneurs? For sure. So there is no doubt in my mind yeah. that it's now as conclusively proven as it can be yeah. that large organizations, large successful organizations are not going to give um, a lifetime job security and mm. high incomes. Yeah. Um, so if you want to have the opportunity to control any part of your own life, you're going to need to do it by acquiring entrepreneurial skills, I think, because a very small number of people will have cool jobs in companies that are doing really well. And everybody else, to some extent, uh, you know, I really respect Amazon, but I don't want to be running around picking goods out of an Amazon warehouse. If I was 30 years younger, I might do that because it would have a great fitness uh, benefit. They pay me instead of being paying for the gym. But that's <laughs> not the future I want. And so many jobs of the future yeah. are low-value jobs within either a low-value organization. Lots and lots of large companies at the moment have no vision of a future. They have mm. no place they're going to. Yeah. And so the only possibility is they squeeze the lemon again and again yeah. for another drip. I don't want to be part of that squeezing process. Right. And so everybody, I truly believe, every adult, should go and dip their toe in this water because there's never been a better time yes. to go and start something affordably 
and that's really key. So choose some money that you can afford to lose. Mm. Choose an area that you know well enough that you don't walk in completely naive yeah. and just get in trouble and do something. Do something. Not Don't build a huge dream. It's yeah. impossible. You work out what the first step might look, for, look like for you. So many first steps that people can do. So much learning that can be had if it works or if it doesn't work. And the trick is if you've worked out what is an affordable loss for you, you don't mind so much. Does it work or does it not work yeah. as a business? Because it will work as a learning experience. And then you get the learning. And if it went well, well that's great. But if it went badly, that's great too. Still learning. You can now work out what, what would be better. What would be better? Take those steps. No one's too, uh, no one's too old and set in their ways. No one's too young and inexperienced to be able to do that today. Great, excellent answer. I love it. Um, when you hear the word patience, <laughs> what is your relationship with it in so, business? Of course. Funny enough, I always used to talk about myself, and I think it's still true, as a patient opportunist. Mm. And what that means is. I have areas where I'm interested and where I know I want the wind at my back. Mm. So there are, at any point in time, there are two or three areas, I've got some at the moment, yeah. where I would like to go and execute on something in that space. Mm. But I'm going to be patient because I'd like the right opportunity to come along. Mm. And if you move around in the world enough and do other things, it may, it may never do, of course, but I'm perfectly happy to let serendipity play a bit, a bit of a part in that. Yeah. Uh, being fast is often expensive and it's often risky. Yeah. So there are times when what you've got to do, do is move with pace and determination. Again, I'm having a background in, in merged acquisitions and in starting new products and new ventures yeah. and new businesses. Um, I know full well it's really important that sometimes you've just got to put the foot to the floor in the accelerator um, or else, to be honest, you're just going to disappear. Because yeah. the market's going to move faster than you. What a lot of people don't understand is that most of the businesses that we think of as real success in those areas, they haven't arrived day one saying no. the only thing that matters, flawless thing. No, no. They spend time working out what is it? What do people like? Um, then when you've got the model straight, now it's time to really accelerate. So that, that patience and being able to find your way through um, is really important. And then so is changing the gear. So now we're going to accept Great. Now, in my experience, um, the next word that comes naturally to ask about is consistency. <laughs> because patience, obviously, as you just mentioned, is very important. Um, but in my experience, also consistency or applying something is important. So what's your... What's your opinion on that? One of the greatest gifts to, to business language was the word that you used earlier, pivot. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if you coined that, but I think it was associated with the lean startup movement. Yeah, I think it was Herx. Yeah, very probably. And, and, um, and I think that's really important. And it gives you a way of thinking about that because the idea of a pivot is you're doing something with determination and consistency because yeah. you can't learn unless you're not consistent. If you're always changing everything, yeah. how do you know it works? Yeah. But then when you learn... This isn't working, mm -hmm. and you choose a direction, you pivot. And the idea of the pivot is you choose a new direction, but you try and keep the speed going. Yeah. So something has changed profoundly, mm. but you keep that energy of progression um, going forward. So again, I've talked about how Rumbly has become magic subscriptions. Yeah. There's a consistency at the core, which is in both cases, um, we've developed an expertise in how to delight consumers um, who subscribe um, to, to a varied service. Um, but we've said, actually, if we take the market, if we completely transform the market we're, we're, we're reaching out to, yeah. we can deliver that in a whole new way. Of course, then you map out that, um, uh, that new market environment. But the, the temptation is always to look back to the old. And that is difficult. So people quite often get stuck with, I want to get back to yeah. either some earlier version of this vision I had or possibly to some company that I'm trying to emulate. I want to become more like them. And that often derails people. Far better to plow your own furrow as long as you're always open to the idea. If I learn from the real world how things work, then I act according to reality, not my ideas. But, but being consistent within that is so vital. Because otherwise, as I say, how do you ever learn anything? How will you, suppose you're growing a venture, 
and you want to attract new people and you want to be at the head of the queue, you want to be a place that people want to work. Yeah. If, if they ask you a question, they get six different answers according to the time of day and your attitude and the weather and all of those things. Why are they going to then throw themselves in, roll the sleeves up and say, I'm going to go for this with you? What is it? No, no, absolutely. Great. Um, quickly, a few questions about yourself. Do you have any specifically within your entrepreneurial activities? Do you have any daily or weekly routine that you apply? Yeah, so uh, so I try and organize my days so that I'm an early bird. So yes. I tend to wake with the light at this time of year. That's pretty early. Yes. And I try and use that time in a very structured way. Mm. Um, now, now, that practice goes back uh, with me forever. Right. So uh, so when I was uh, an employee in a large company, yeah. uh, my personal goal was before most people were walking in the door, yeah. I'd done enough of my day job that yes. if I did no more of it that day, I'd be fine. Wow. And um, and that works really well. So most large companies, large companies tend to be very, very effective, massively inefficient. Mm. And the inefficiency is actually really important. If you're a stable company, you drive out inefficiency everywhere. Yeah. But if you're a company in a dynamic market, you need some inefficiency because you need capacity. You need sometimes to be able to go and explore something that you haven't yeah. done before. So that working practice worked well in that environment. And to some extent, I've, you know, I've, I've carried that on because I can use pieces of time. So particularly, there are, there are lots of activities where it doesn't matter what time you do them. Anything which, where you're engaging with the internet yeah, yeah. Um, uh, is, is just fine. So thinking about how to use that time really well mm. And then also having the discipline to say, okay, I've hit my cutoff point and now I'm That's doing it. the day job or whatever it might be. That, 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 that working practice is one that I definitely works for me. I, I recommend for other people too. Yes. And do you have a particular morning routine from when you wake up, apart from probably accessing a large amount of coffee? <laughs> knowing you? you spotted it. <laughs> I'm rarely productive until I put coffee into my system. Yeah. Do you do... Anything else in terms of your routine, or you just get straight so to work? There, there are family things. So during term time, I'm often the one who has to has to get my um, uh, one of my children to uh, to, the, to the railway station. Yeah. The dog needs walking. Oh, <laughs> the dog. Yeah. So 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 there's there's sort of family routine to fit in as well. Um, but uh, but I will change. So from from week to week, mm. I may change how I'm using. So I've got yeah. like I've got a fixed amount of time. Yes. It varies over the year, but it tends to be fixed. Sure. Um, in, a, in a particular period, and I'll vary what I'm doing with that, that amount of time um, uh, but I'll simply do that as consistently as I can uh, and I'm always open to conversation so, so I do um, I do deliberately mm. put myself a little bit on the line so I'm, I'm always happy to um, to offer my experience insight wisdom or possibly folly to other people because right. I find that stimulating yeah um, and the best way of learning I've always found a great way of learning is by sharing the learning that you think you have because people may jump in and correct you yeah, and then fantastic if they've just brought you news that's fresher than the news you had. Everybody Great. wins. Excellent. Do you have any kind of uh, exercise routine? I know you cycle a lot. <laughs> I try and cycle as much as I can. I have a dog to walk. Um, I do have an electric bike, so, uh, so which you use often. So I can choose how much of the battery um, works and how much I work. Um, and actually, only a couple of days ago, I finally installed the um, the Google Tracker, um, the sort of fitness tracker app onto my phone, just so okay. I could actually measure that and, uh, and yeah. start to target it. Because otherwise, again, you can you, can you have an easily, impression, but you, yeah, you think you think you're you're regular, and, and I realised, for example, with, with the cycle, I'm thinking actually, how many times since since I bought this particular one have I been out with it? Yeah, the numbers can't quite work, so I need to count no, this. No, no, I, 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 yeah, I, I appreciate that. I'll do that as well. Um, Last two questions has been fascinating so far. Um, where do you see yourself as an entrepreneur in three years' time? So, um, so thinking about uh, those two things that I mentioned, so magicsubscriptions.com, yeah. innovatesuffolk.com. Yeah. So Magic Subscriptions, um, uh, we're, we're, I think we're at the stage where we've applied a whole bunch of learning. We've found yeah. the market that, mm. um, that works. And we're now on that point of just finessing our understanding of what entrepreneurs need from the Magic Subscriptions system yeah. so that we can um, kind of kick the accelerator. Uh, so I would hope that, um, uh, that within six to 12 months, we've got that sufficiently um, a sufficiently straightforwardly mm. established so that we can really accelerate that like crazy, uh, which means that two, three years out, I'd expect that either we would be 
growing it again or exiting it and find the next thing yeah. to do. With the Innovate Suffolk, um, on that same time frame at the moment, it's getting activity to happen in a place where everybody says, oh, we can't do that, can't do that, can't do that. So this year's objective is starting to, to let change people, people's mind. carry on saying, we can't do that. Oh, but that happened. That must have been a one-off. Oh, it was a two-off. <laughs> next year, I'd like to be um, working much more closely with incubators and accelerators. Um, and then the year after that, um, I'd like us to have a, um, a fund specifically focused on um, on local entrepreneurs and um, uh, and so on, associated with incubators and so on. So being inclusive yeah. is really important to me because the, the local government has a role to play, local entrepreneurs yeah. have a role to play, local education has a role to play. Yeah. And creating places where all of those can come together Again, we're sitting in Cambridge right now where that has been done really well. And uh, and people easily underestimate how difficult it is to create an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Yeah, It's a purposeful activity. It takes a time and it doesn't just happen by magic. Um, and and you know, I, my, uh, my undergraduate degree was at Oxford. Yeah. I studied both Oxford and Cambridge. Oxford is starting. Yes. It really, it's starting to have impact in some of the areas where Cambridge has for 30, 40 years yes. and been doing really well. They both have very, very similar um, uh, opportunities. You could say Cam- uh, huge universities, closer, amazing universities, yeah, yeah closer to the, 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 the commercial heart yeah. um, in terms of certainly for IT, the Thames Valley is just on hand and so on, always punch below its weight. Cambridge, some of the disadvantages of Cambridge have just been completely overcome by some of the people who've invested hugely in making yeah. us a place that works really well. Yeah. So, so I, you know, uh, Suffolk, you know, even even with my most ambitious hat on, I'm not expecting that Suffolk is going to somehow push Cambridge out of the way. But there are certain areas where Suffolk is just such a great place to live um, and do business. Mm-hmm. We're also the highest growth area for people who are if you like young retired and approaching retirement. Yeah. Lots and lots of company directors um, move into Suffolk because of the quality of life, because yeah. affordable housing, good transport links, and so on. And, um, and I'd like to see more of those people carry on as operators or become active and skilled investors as well because then we have opportunities second to none great if you could give last question of the day so if you could give someone starting a business or starting their entrepreneurial adventure some advice what would that be find someone who's determined Hmm. who's you can see they're actually doing something yeah and ask them how can i help offer them an amount of time say i will give you five hours over the course of a week yeah. for the next 12 weeks mm. um, i want to learn from that and i right. i don't expect anything from it or pay me some minimum, minimum amount you know learn on somebody else's project um uh, everything that you possibly can and i think one of the greatest mistakes that people make is underestimating how many different things you have to keep your eye on when you're right. an entrepreneur and of course, if it's your first project and it's it's the thing that you have and you care about, yeah. the pressure goes up and you keep on discovering areas where you don't have the skills, you don't have the network, you don't have the connections. So yeah. I don't want to say to people, you can't do anything. No, you can do so many things so fast. Yeah. But often to learn those skills, at least to start to learn, what would the kind of person, the kind of product, the kind of service, the kind of network that would make a difference to me? Where would I find that? What would it look like? A great way of learning that is go and work with something that's already ambitious. I'm not saying go into a long established business no. and offer yourself, a, you're, you're just going to learn about that business. But find someone who's making a difference. If they're not interested, they're not the person you want anyway. Find and the next person. If they say, yeah, if they say yeah, yeah, I could really do that, and, and here's the thing that I want them to do, um, already you've got the basis for a, for a great learning experience. Learn, 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 learn by doing, and then start doing, and then. Fantastic. Jeremy, it has been amazing uh, listening to you. I know you for a long time. I think some of the stuff uh, I heard already, but you know, all concentrated in this hour and a bit has been absolutely fascinating. So I would like to thank you very much for this. It's a very great pleasure. Thank you. And, and uh, I'll be interested in hearing more about your all of your businesses, particularly the the initiative in entrepreneurial initiatives in Suffolk. So that would be great. (laughs) Thank you very much. Thank you.